Sometimes in our game, unique plays pop up. Let's look at unique plays today on Five Play Friday. Stick around. Greetings, welcome back to another episode of Five Play Friday, the show where we look at game video, get better as basketball officials. Let's get started without delay and look at, take a look at play number one. You make the call. All right, a couple of players doing the do -si do there on the court. What do you have on this play? What would be your ruling? Do we have a double foul? Do we have an intentional foul? We have a combination. What do you have? Put your ruling down in the comments below. And remember to stick around to the end of the video as we will analyze play number one in all its glory. All right, and with that, let's move on now to play number two. All right, not something you see every day, an unusual jump ball scenario. Welcome back to Five Play Friday, the show where we look at plays. My name is Greg Austin with The Better Official, and thank you for joining us today. And to analyze play number two, we have with us today a special guest. Andrew Gross has joined, producing clips. Andrew, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. How are you? Yeah, happy St. Patrick's Day. I am doing well. It's, uh, it's, it's a great day. Fantastic. Well, uh, obviously, um, we've we've uh, seen plays together on Facebook groups, etc. Really appreciate your knowledge. I've, I've actually uh, had a chance to see your progression as you've moved from a high school official and now collegiate official, um, and it's exciting to see. Very dynamic on the court. Very knowledgeable about the rules, and we're analyzing plays today so we can all get better. What do you have on this jump ball play? Yeah, so I mean, on this play, um, you know, the one thing that we need to remember is that the jumper has to stay in the center circle until the ball is touched by either or both of them. And then along with that, um, after that happens, they can't even just grab it if they're outside the circle. It's got to touch a player. It's got to touch the official. It's got to um, touch the floor, any of those other three things. I mean, I don't know if they took the backboard rule out of it or not. But <laughs> I'm not sure I've seen a jump ball hit the backboard. But we got to remember those three things for sure. And if it somehow gets to that backboard, then they can also go and repeat it as well. Indeed. Uh, you know, it's not something you see in our brain is like, um, what is going on? It's one of, a high processing play. Um, that's the way I look at it. What we have there. Just a second. Um so the restriction on the jumper is that they're not allowed to leave the circle until oh, the ball is I, touched. As far as I'm aware, until the ball is touched by either or both jumpers, and then they still can't even possess it. They they, they just have to wait until it's a floor, a player, or an official. But they can leave the center restraining circle after it's touched by either or both jumpers. Right. So if our if our if our uh, our player in red here had been like in this position when the ball was touched, uh, they'd be legal in terms of leaving the circle. But in any way you slice it, they are going to be illegal in that they have caught the ball as a jumper before the jump ball ends, right? Yeah. Not something you see every day. To add another point, I mean, I could have clipped one of my own plays. I just found this one a little more um unique in, in how 
the player starts leaving and you almost have that contact with that other player right before the person possesses it. And so that kind of puts it into a weird perspective where had that player touched it first, that person might actually be able to grab that ball and then go take off and, and um, go to the hoop. I had one in a right before a state tournament where we're starting the overtime period and Tipper tips it from one tipper to the other one. And she just grabs it and takes off running. And it takes us like three seconds to process the play and be like, wait, they're not, <laughs> not able to do that yet. So it was, a, well, I think it's a better one to kind of show some nuances where that if the ball is tipped by another player, then that jumper could have possessed that ball and taken off right after that. Yeah. And it always points out the fact that um, in jump ball scenarios, we are, I mean, we've just taken, we're, our bearings aren't set, first of all. I mean, we're, we're, we always tell ourselves, hey, I'm ready to officiate this game. And then something like this occurs and, and you know, we're immediately challenged uh, to, to sort things out and do it in a timely fashion. Um, but of course, we always want to give ourselves a little grace in this yeah. situation. If we wait a tick or two ticks or even three ticks, and then realize, hey, that is a violation. We can always blow the whistle, own the fact that we came late, and just yep. make the proper ruling on the play. Well, and then, the, I mean, the follow-up question is, do you put time back at that that eight-minute or that 20-minute if you're doing halves or that five-minute if you're in the overtime? Because there's no possession. There's no – it's violation on the touch or catch, I guess. And then you put the time back on the clock. You reset the shot clock. And then the arrow goes to the team that offended. And so there's a lot of things that go into that because we haven't even had a tick technically go off the clock at that point. Well, when does our clock stop start on this play? Oh, it and does start does on it, touch. So I guess it does, yeah, does it start legally. Yeah, it starts on that first touch, I guess. So, I, yeah, you would have that. There would be no possession. So, I guess you would restart the 35 shot. Well, I guess South Dakota, we have a 35 shot clock. I don't know. We're doing other California as well. Yeah. Yeah, so all these things, we're going to have to sort them out. And, and what are we going to do uh, mechanically on the floor? Who's going to have the throw yeah. in? We're going, to be, we're going to be in a moment of, uh, again, our bearings aren't set. It's going to be confusing. We just have to own that fact. Let's figure it out. Anybody take the ball in. Let's make sure our clocks are right. The arrow is right. Everybody understands what has just occurred. And then we move forward, right? Yeah. Just Absolutely. have to own, own it. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a potentially a, a unique situation happens you know just got to own it <sighs> yes and it's the restraining circle so in a previous episode of five play friday i had uh said it's the semicircle but it's actually the circle right so our jumper can go in the opposite direction and still be legal as long as they are within the circle uh before the first touch as always is it uh if we're going to get into the minutia of a restart in the game of basketball, the yeah. jump ball it doesn't have as much uh, as much weight as uh, throw-ins or free throws. Yeah, yep. Which are going to happen a lot. All right, all right. We've looked at a unique jump ball play. Let's move on to our next play. Let's look at play number three. All right, so we have a shooting foul from lead coming out of their primary on this play. Andrew, have we, have we committed a crime here by yeah, doing I mean, so? At times, at times um, you know, this is not a play that you want to uh, come and get as a lead, especially like if you look at it, it is not even lanes. It's not even it's my side of the lane. It's opposite side of the lane. Um but if you look in the middle of the lane, there's no action going there. And my eyes, obviously, a lot of times we get our eyes watching towards the ball. So it gets over there. And right when that happens, I just see the contact going up on the middle of the forearm and working its way up before it's fully extended. Um, you know, there's different philosophies on touches on the hands and things like that. 
But this one to me was a clear, he hadn't even extended his arm. He's going up in the shooting motion. He contacts him right in the middle of the arm. I'm waiting for my partners to make a call. Nothing, nothing. Okay, I'm going to go and get this one. And, it, and it's really cadenced, really late. But I think it's a foul we need to get in this game. Because if we don't get that one, uh, we're going to go down the other side. We might get a, a cheap one. And then they're going to, the coach is going to go from zero to 100 really quickly. Yeah. Well, uh, it, you know, this, this, this play brings up the question of obvious foul out of my primary. What am I going to do? Yep. What am I going to do? Right. It's like, you know, some officials want to hold on to a philosophy that, you know, I'll live and die in my primary, you stay in yours, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But, and, and sometimes it's just like, I'm not officiating that play. I'm not ball watching on the play, but the play, I see the play, right? Yeah. Those things are going to happen. And there's, you know, an obvious foul. And so we have to make a decision. It's like, am I going to ignore an obvious foul and, uh, you know, sort of support our philosophy as a crew to uh, stay in our primary, et cetera? Or are we going to say, look, that's an obvious foul. You don't have a foul. You don't have a foul. I'm going to blow a whistle. Yeah. And, and it, you can't just be like 99% sure. Like this one has to be even almost more than 100%. You have to know how the contact happened, where it happened, and be able to explain that to the coach and say, this one's going to show up on film and you're going to be able to see this one. We can't just go, you know, as the term is, fishing in other people's pond and thinking that it's the call and then it doesn't show up on film. It has to show up on the film if you're going to do that. Yeah, I actually, I actually love the call from lead in this situation because a lot of times, um, if we, you know, our view as uh, as center is, I see the players, the defender's arm move in a fashion that could possibly have created contact, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure it was on the opposite side of yeah. the arm, etc. And the same as the trail or either official just, uh, in, you know, was, was looking at the feet or the body or, and missed the contact up top. Yeah. But if you're ever in the position here as lead and you, and you see this, you get that sideway act, sideways action by the defender on a shooter's arm. It is super obvious. Yeah. Well, and that's a good point to make is that hands coming from the inside. The C is going to have a tough time seeing that play on his side. And the trail where he's at, he I mean, it's its one that comes right through and almost opens up to that lead on that play more than either of the other two play, uh, officials. You could maybe see, like you said, you can maybe see from the C that maybe there was some contact there, but it has to be like you have to be – you probably would have to take a step down or two to then see that. So, I mean, if we want to talk about position readjustment, seeing the player move and pull up, well, now let's take two steps down to our left because then we might be able to see that. I think at this point where the C is, we're getting stacked. And yeah. so we're not seeing if that contact is actually there on the arm. Yeah. When this player, yeah. So that when this player steps down, we, you know, they're, they're obviously beginning their shooting motion and our, our center should definitely try to position adjust so they can get the best possible look. There's no way they're going to get it outside, you know, any, any sort of look here. So if we read the players here, we could get better. But it's still not going to be ideal. Yeah, agree. Does the foul rise to the level of obvious, and therefore, you know, and then there even, you know, a problem would be like if our center had a play. Let's see, let's say here at the M on the court, and we're lead over here, and we we see a rake across the arm. It's like at some point we're just too far away to uh, to come out of our primary. But on this one, we're in great shape. And I, th I think following up on that too, Greg, is just like, you, you've, I've got no action in the post area there. So my eyes need to go somewhere else to find what's going to hurt us next. And so if, it, if there's nothing in the post, i got to find something. And if that's the next thing that's going to hurt me, that's what I'm going to look for. And I, I, and I think the, the cop out, not my area, I can get away with saying, you know, in that play, I can't say I was looking at something else because there's no way I could have looked at anything else. But on another play, say that guy on the post comes over and starts posting up really hard. He's not going to do it on this team. But say he comes in and, and seals in hard and I got to rotate over. Well, I'm not going to see that shot because I'm going to go get to the post action. So I, I think the cop out is less when you actually have action in your area. Um, but yeah, on this play, there's no action in, in 
almost any area, actually. Every, the only action is that play. Hey, we've got a tremendous group of show supporters who help fuel our broadcasts. Who's up on the show supporter big board today? James Frazee, Yvette Perry, Aaron Wall, Jacob Krause, and Mike Connors. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? I will make sure, I will make sure personally that there is a link down in the show notes below, and I will definitely make sure there is one up above. Let's move on. Let's look at play number four. Well, come on, ref. That's got to be something because everybody on the bench jumped up and waved their arms. So that's got to be something. What do we have on this play? Yeah, we've got a, a nice fast break, uh, a, a sweet pass to there, and then a guy goes up for layup. And this is the one that gets a lot of people because you see it in the NBA. You see it in, in the college game. But if we're talking specific NFHS rules, backboard means nothing. The flight is everything we're looking at. And so if this ball hits the backboard, now does it go to the downward flight? And this is where I think the downfall of the NFHS rule is, because now we as officials have to determine, is this downward flight? And I think it's really tough. But on this play, I think he hits it so quickly that we can't say that that ball is going downward yet. Um, and obviously we see that. We see the bench jump up. We see the coaches all jump up. Um, I, the thing you can't see on this play is I put my hand up and I yell at them, I'll get back to you in a few seconds, like when we come down and we had a timeout, we go down there, I go to that side. And I said, this is what I saw. And I said, I saw the ball hit. Well, even the coach knew too. He's like, I know the ball can touch the backboard, which is surprising because you don't know, see too many coaches that know the rule. And he's like, I know it can touch the backboard, but I thought it was on the downward flight. And I said, I agree it touched the backboard, but in my opinion, it was not going down. And so for me, it was surprising to hear him say that. And then like he just moved on right after that. I think it helped that um, the score was about a 20 point differential at that point. So that may have helped him just move on right away. But at the time it was the number one and number two teams in the state in our class A. And so it's a highly contested game or maybe an 18, I don't know, but it, was, it wasn't really that close of a game. I guess the other variable here is, you know, whether or not the ball is in the cylinder yeah, right. correct. Uh, I mean, so we've got it. We've got two two levels to think about. One is goaltending because it's on a downward flight and has a chance to yeah. go in. But the other yeah. is if the player like uh, had you know lays the ball and it's in the square of the backboard yeah. and it's contacted, we could have basket interference as well. Puts a lot of pressure on the officials. Correct, and that that's why this is the one rule I am just indifferent about at the NFHS level. I like a lot of the other rules. For, for high school's players' sake. But this one is like, now we're putting the officials in a situation where I've got to determine flight and in cylinder versus it hit backboard, we're going to count this goal. Yeah. And you work NCAA men's uh, yeah. as well. So it's like, it's like you probably, you know, get there. That's the rule. Well, that makes this a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I, so uh, the one thing I would caution on, on a play like this is I had a I had a similar play a few years ago, very distinctly remember where it may have been in the cylinder, but my brain said, uh, I you know I immediately said, oh wait a minute, no that's going to be legal because it's not on the downward flight, and I basically stopped officiating the legality of the play yeah. and sort of set aside the possibility that it was actually in the cylinder. Yeah. And I go back and watch the video, and it's like, mm, yeah, and so uh, you know. Sometimes we 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 uh, sort of celebrate our knowledge about a rule and our uh, uh, the lack of knowledge by others, you know, the bench, et cetera. And it's like, yeah. no, you don't know the rule, but we yeah. we disconnect from other possibilities. So that's yeah. one thing I'd caution, because <laughs> it happened to me. 
bouncing eyeballs. That's definitely a thing. And the other thing for me is like, is like you're in transition. You want to get static. You expect to play at the basket or the play happens. And then we're like, I find myself getting stuck. It, I'm, I'm in that spot, like at the 38 foot, at the 38 foot mark. I've, mm -hmm. I've done a great job of stopping so that I don't have bouncing eyeballs and then I'm stuck. Right. Yeah. And I've got to get going again. Keep moving. Yeah. And I, and I think uh, someone just commented it. If you don't know, don't blow. Like that's, it's kind of a good one for this. Um, but it's also kind of tough because if you're going to award points on this, you have to know um, that it is goaltending. But it's also a catch-22 because these are points that could be legitimate and we're not giving it to them. Yeah. And so it's, 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 it's almost not the don't know, don't blow, because I think that's – you can get away with missing a foul. Missing two points is really tough to – to not give someone it's true it's true and especially i mean you know this game sounds like it was not super close competitive no. etc um but we always want to take our adjudication of plays into the most intense moments like this time of year when yep. uh you know teams are losing and going home um in tournament scenarios and if we have end of game etc we want to refine our craft so that when this call occurs at an absolutely crucial moment of a game we are correct all right let's move on let's look at play number five Well, that is what we call a fine how do you do. That is uh, a pretty rough shot on that one. Yeah, so this is yeah, this is a college division three game, and I'll be honest, this is my first college game. Huh. So I'm just just in the thick of it. I've already got this coach, uh, this you can see him on the screen. I've already got him on me because I just gave an intentional foul to his his son who's on the team. And then I go with this and you can tell, like, first off, I shouldn't be walking towards the table. I should be walking directly towards those two, because I don't know what the player that just got smacked in the face is going to be doing next. Um, so I need to walk, you know, we should be walking towards that, maybe even sprinting into that. I mean, I see very little um, guy coming to try to do something more to him, but yeah, we should be sprinting into this. And, and it's, I'm the only one who sees this because that's that's what we're looking at in the free throw attempt. I've got the bottom row, the next the next two over. The C's got the top one and the, and the two closest on the top on my side. So I should be the only one that sees this, but you might catch it out of the corner of your eye if you're that that center on this play. Um, but yeah, if when we go back to the large the large view of this one, the not slow mode, you can see number 31 right on the bench, and then the guy way on the end. They, they see this hit, and their reaction, in my opinion, is just priceless. So I'll, we'll just wait here for a second. But you can, as soon as it gets hit, just watch number 31 on the bench there. He, he knows that it's, like, <laughs> not something good that happened there. Um, so, yeah, on this play, like, this is – this in the college realm, this is a flagrant two. In the high school, this is just a flagrant technical foul. This player should be – should have been out of the game, should have been gone. Unfortunately, I was – a new official. Um, okay. No one else saw the play. I was the only one who saw the play. And so they kind of talked me off the ledge. Uh, they were down by 30 points. I mean, it was, it was kind of a lot of things that came into this, which shouldn't come into it. But, um, yeah, this is a flagrant foul. This player should have been ejected. And when you eject a player in high school, they sit on the bench somewhere in the confines of the gym. They don't get to go to the locker room in college. Obviously, we, we toss them to the, the locker room, make them – go there and sit the rest of the game. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting that that your partners had nothing on this play, always pointing out the fact that, um, especially it sounds like it was a not a competitive game at this point. Yeah. Yeah, right. And we're just sort of like potentially going through the motions. And we always yeah. have to caution against that, especially if, it, you know, there's any sort of energy in the game, et cetera. But the fact that, we, that nobody is aware of this from center or trail, 
mm-hmm. you know, something that's that's relatively obvious. Um, uh, you know, we'll always have to examine our own uh, role in situations similar to this. Are we really connected to the game? Are we really working the game, et cetera? Yeah. And I think for me, one thing that that has shown me is like, if I have a younger new official and I'm the R on the game, like, I'm not going to say, are you sure you want to go with this? Like, I'm going to say, tell me what you saw. And if they tell me what they saw and that's what they saw. Then we're going with that. Because if I have no knowledge of it, I can't add input. And if, if, for example, say it wasn't that bad, say that he squared up and hit him, like not squared up, but hit him in the chest, didn't hit him in the face, you know, like we probably still have a foul on this play, but it's, it may not be disqualifying foul. If, right. if I was the new official, I said, oh, he hit him in the face. Like he just went and cold cocked him in the face, but he hit him in the chest. I'd be like, okay, we, we, we can eject this guy if you think that's what he did. But if the film comes back and doesn't show that, I, you know, I have to, I have to eat it as the, the R saying like, yeah, I didn't see it, but I, I trusted my official and we all went with the ruling of an ejection. Um, and sometimes that's, that's a tough pill to swallow, but I don't think I'm going <clears> to <throat> inhibit my official from saying, yeah, he got just cold cocked in the face. Yeah. Yeah. You want to empower uh, younger officials to, you know, but it, especially in this situation is what do you have? What did you see? Yeah. What is your, you know, and, and the thing is that if you are, uh, if we look at Black 31 here, he has the human reaction of, yeah. oh my God, right? You see that from the cheerleaders yeah. as well, or or somebody adjacent to the game. It's like, oh, right? And if yeah. it rises to the level of, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, you can trust yeah. your instincts. Uh, that's amazing this happened in your first collegiate game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So where do we, uh, where are we in the adjudication of the play? Let's see. Ball's released, and then yep. the foul occurs. So it's while the ball is in flight. Yep. Just to be aware. Ball goes of. in though too. Yeah. So that's, that's another thing to take into account. Um, I mean, at the, I guess at any level, it doesn't entirely matter because this is going to be a technical foul or flagrant, I guess, in, in college. But the team that's offended is going to get this ball, and we're going to go division line in high school. And in college, I mean, if, if anyone cares, we're going to be – we're probably going to be – man, I'm trying to think because it's right on that free throw line, and that's the line of demarcation in, high, in college, not the semicircle. So I, I would assume we'd go down towards the either side of the lane line. But it's <laughs> – it's one of those that's just like, okay, uh, team that gets offended gets the ball. They're going to shoot two free throws, and um, this is an intentional one. Well, no, this would be intentional in um, ball's live. This would be an intentional foul, wouldn't it? It'd be an intentional yeah. foul. The ball was live, and and there's no team control. So if if our uh, if our uh, uh, offending player was the offensive player, uh, whether the ball or not was released or not would be a factor. Yep. We just want to know all of the things. Mm-hmm. We're not going to cancel the goal for any reason here. The ball's no. released. Yeah. And, but even if it wasn't released, we have a foul by a defensive player mm-hmm. while a player has begun mm-hmm. their habitual try for goal. Yep. Continuous motion would apply as well. Yep. So what did you end up with on the play? We ended up with a what we call was a flagrant one in college, which would be similar to, I would say, an intentional foul. Intentional. Um the thing I think we did wrong was um, in in the adjudication of where to throw the ball in bounds. We ended up giving it back to the blue team, which you know the thought was, oh, it's a technical, and it doesn't it didn't rise to a flagrant technical. So a technical is point of interruption in the college game, but this is clearly an intentional foul, um, mm-hmm. and it would be in the high school game which would then mean that that player that is offended has to shoot. We can't have any player shoot this free throw. It has to be the offended player. Right. Um, and then or their eligible school. substitute on a play like this. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, and that's, I think and our, that's our, our offended player does a great job of taking the punch, as it were. Right? Yeah. He's like, uh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. And, and so, like, if for some reason, say we had blood on this play in, in the college game, um, you know, we would – his, the coach could then sub someone in for him because it's a flagrant foul. 
it's an intentional foul that would result in him to come out of the game. Had this been a common foul and he's just unable to do it, then it's a different game. But so yeah. what are we gonna do? Let's look at our next play. All right, two-person game, ball in the front court, deflected into the, hold on, hold on, deflected into the backcourt, and the coach knows the ball was tipped here. Do we have a backcourt violation on this play? I think I think this is a, a super difficult play with two-person, um, like, I... So I, I, for a year, I was video editing uh, for a company. And so I got to see many plays and just uh, clip one here and there. But this one, I think, is really tough because, first off, you've got just two officials, the the trail officials on the opposite side. All he sees is the ball go up in the air and a guy retrieve it, and he's on the line as he's retrieving it. Um, so, I, I mean, in a lot of things, I don't fault either of them. And the only person that maybe could have saw this would have been the lead, but he's almost shielded off in my opinion, but to go to the, the point of this play um, ball is tipped. It goes towards the, uh, the backcourt and it appears the guy's foot is on the line, like right as or prior to um, the catching of this ball, which would then put that player in the backcourt. And so the player would just retain possession in the backcourt after a tip ball, last touch by the defense. And then we're just going to keep playing on from there. So it would be no violation in this play. Tough call. Tough call. Is our player ever in the backcourt? Would also be a question on this play. Their foot is obviously over, <clears throat> but we can get those scenarios where a player is on the ball of their foot and their yeah. heel is raised. Correct. Yeah, I, I mean, I would... I think this one is one of those that you're splitting hairs trying to figure out. Is he really on the line? Is he really not? And I think this is the benefit of the doubt on the fact that it is tipped and his foot is, I mean, it could be a micrometer off that line if you think it's, it is, but mm -hmm. let's go benefit of the doubt. His heels on the line and we're, we're calling it a illegal play. Not something you see every day. Are you talking about two man or <laughs> I think that's no, more just common. Not a, just not a, not a play where the ball is deflected and a player catches it and they're, uh, yeah. you know, in that situation where their heel is raised. Yeah. Billy Max says legal. Legal if tipped. Yeah. Tough. Yeah. It, a trail could have done what uh, you, you ever watch uh, re uh, wrestling officials. Right when they're evaluating where their players pinned, they go over, they jump down on the floor, and they're looking like. <laughs> I thought you were talking about running around the circle and trying to get a better look at it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, getting on his horse here could have helped. Uh, yeah, yeah, tough, tough. The line is in the backcourt. That is true by rule. Correct, Thomas. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That was play five. Okay. I guess another thing to think about, Greg, here is say he catches that ball and next thing you know, someone comes and tips it again. Once he catches the ball, now we have another 10 second count that we got to start. Yeah. Technically. Technically. And so we're at 422 right there. If for some reason the ball was tipped, I mean, obviously that's probably not going to happen on this play, but we got to have a lot of things coming into our mind here. Like, okay, we've got another 10 seconds to get across the division line. Because I've seen plays where next thing you know, a weird thing happens. It gets tipped in the backcourt. And a guy, well, I guess if the guy was in the front court and tipped it, I guess he would start when it hit the backcourt again. But 
say guy comes up and he dribbles it off his foot. Now we got to keep that 10 second count rolling. Sean says, had an evaluator recommend taking a diagonal path toward the center circles. Yeah, so uh, I guess from here, well, question would be, is like when the ball settles here, if we were looking at two-person mechanics, right, and the ball's in this position, I think our trails has a pretty good look, but then it goes, it goes here, this is the sticky part in two person. I mean, who's going to officiate this play? Are we going to say, um, okay, even though it's below, it's above the free throw line extended lead, pick this action up, or are we both going to officiate this double team? Right? But I guess what Sean's uh, emphasizing is taking a path here, getting more adjacent to the center circle to, so that we have an angle on the play, which we don't have from here would be a good takeaway. Mm -hmm. But it's a tough spot on the court. The coffee's replenished. Nice. Nice. All right, I go there. Yeah. Yeah, here in California, we work a lot of two-person... A mix, but a lot of two-person at the high school level. Hmm. All right. We're going there, and I'm going to go. What would happen if from here I said, all right, hey, at the start of the show, we looked at our first play. You make the call, play. Let's take a look back at play number one. All right, so we're in transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, okay. Sorry about that. Let's go here. Andrew, this is not a play you see every day. What do you have on this play ruling? Yeah, this is this is a very very weird play. First, I mean the dribbler loses the ball and they both go for it and then they both lose it. But what's really hard to see and you might be able to see as it zooms in um is white I think he was number white 3 or 4. He ends up squeezing, I can't even show you with my arms, but like he ends up squeezing his right arm and like hooking the player in green. So he's just floating in air and holding on to him. As he's in the greens, guy's like, dude, get off of me. So then once that happens, he just throws him. And I'm sitting there trying to figure out what the heck is going on. How is white three just floating in the air like this, not even walking? And he's going along with this guy. And green is like not even grabbing onto him. Like, how is this happening? So you'll see me. I'm staying here like, what the heck is going on? And then when I see the throw, I'm like, okay, I have to have a foul on this. And so uh, on this play, uh, unfortunately, we end up going just – uh, double foul, but I think we could get away with going double intentional because what player in white is doing right here is not a legal play. Um, but I didn't recognize what he was doing until I saw the guy, like, say, get off of me and throw him. And so at that point, we, what we probably have, if we're going by the rules, we have an intentional foul on white, and then we have a dead ball technical on green, just in the order of the things happening. Um, but I think we can get away with going double intentional because both technically happen in the live play before I blow my whistle. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's such a weird play that happens that you just like, why, why is this happening? What's going on here?
but it's a good thing to note that when you have something going on, don't leave it just because you're supposed to get down the court. You've got two other officials. I mean, for us, at least I've got two other officials on this play that they're going to be officiating up and down the court and I can stay with this the whole way. Yeah. What a puzzler, right? So anytime we've get players who are clamping, right? It's challenging even in slow motion to determine who is the offending player here or are yeah. both players offending because there's, uh, you know, we, we always want to get an open look on plays, but mm-hmm. because of the player's action, the illegal part of what they're doing is becomes obscured, right? Or, or, uh, or confusing, right? In the, in the embrace. Yeah. But we do see the fact that white is floating in the air and ultimately yeah. gets tossed to the ground, uh, you know, gives us some signals about what we can have on this play. Yeah. And I, I walked up to the coach and he's like, well, it should have been an intentional foul on green. Cause that's not a basketball play. And I turned to him, I said, well, what your guy did by grabbing him and floating with him is not an, a, a basketball play either. And so he kind of was like, okay with it after that. But I, I, he really wanted an intentional foul. And I, and I understand why he wants that. But yeah, I just, I just couldn't do, I'm like, I'm not going to give someone a higher penalty on this one. But let's say we do go intentional on white and technical on green. This is one where we're going to end up shooting free throws because um, they're two. They're not offsetting fouls here. We've got an intentional foul, so we're going to have two free throws for that offended player. So the, the bigger guy is going to shoot two free throws, and then we're going to have a technical, a dead ball technical on him. And the team in white, they're going to choose someone to shoot the free throws, and then they're going to get the ball after that play. And of course, at the division line and across the table, don't do what I did one year and get everything right and then inbound it right in front of the table. Not the greatest crime. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so if, so what did you end up on the play? Just a foul on. We just did double, double personal fouls. Double and... personal fouls. So, in a double yep. foul situation, we're going to resume point of interruption. That would be white team control at the, the spot nearest yep. to where the ball was near the division line. Um, and yep. that's how we'll resume. Yep. Well, I, I mean, I like yeah, that. really close to the division line. Really close. I mean, you could honestly, I mean, it's somewhere in that range of front court. So we probably could go anywhere, but if we're going yeah, by the film and exactly where it happened, it's probably right by the division line. All right. Let's look at a bonus play. All right, throw-in violation is ruled. Come on, ref. Isn't that pretty severe on this play? What do yeah, we have here? I mean, I, the first thing that kid that grabbed the ball and walked out of bounds is like, that's, that's, not, that's not what I was trying to do. And I'm like, I get it. But by rule, the guy had the ball out of bounds. He threw it into you, and you took a step out of bounds. I was – I'm like, this is not a play that you like calling. It's not a play that you see. And typically that person they toss it to is in, is out of bounds with them. They just hand it off and take off running. But I, I don't think this is splitting hairs. I think this is by the rule. He's had possession out of bounds. He threw it into a guy legally in bounds. And as soon as we've done that, we've completed a throw in. So after that point, everything else has to be legal. And he just walks out of bounds with the ball. And so we, at that point, we have to call an out, uh, out of bounds. Yeah. So when does the throw in begin? Uh, after a scored goal is key in this equation, right? And, and yeah. there's there's a couple of things. One is the timing of the play is unusual because of the batting of the ball. Right? Yeah. And anytime the ball is batted uh, on a scored goal, we want to be aware of who did the batting, yep. right? Uh, you know, but it's it is our throwing team. Yeah. Yeah. Everything was uh, after that. Then everything sort of settles and becomes the normal routine, except. Um, our count has already begun. Yep. 
Oh, and I think this, to note too, this isn't a throw-in violation because he completes a throw-in legally. This is whether it's traveling. I don't know if it's traveling because I think he steps out of bounds before he travels, but this is not a bounds violation. Yes. That is what we would have. And I guess the question is, do we have any ability in this instance to recognize that, wait a minute, my count, which I do habitually, actually um, should not have started in that I didn't recognize what the players on the court were doing. And can I suspend my count or not? Yeah. Now, the, the coach on the other end of the floor is that you began your count. Right, this yep. throw-in has begun by rule, and they yep. have complete uh, rule support for that. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that's where you can't you can't kind of give credence to what happened there. Is that coach knows, and especially by like in the college realms, they know the rules a little bit more than high school coaches. So he he'd be all over us saying, "Hey, this is this is a play, and you allowed a legal an illegal action here, and they're going to send that to my supervisor. They're going to show this clip, and say, "Hey, we lost the game by three. Not that that's gonna. This is gonna. Do, but we lost the game by three. This is one possession that we should have had under our hoop yeah. on an inbound play. Yep, I think it's you know we're kind of kick. I, for me, I see this and I'm like kind of kicking myself that I began the throw in count, but uh, you know I began it because the player had the ball out of bounds, right? Yep. Even though I didn't recognize potentially what was about to occur here, you know, but unlucky, unlucky. Yeah. Sean's going with travel, out of bounds. Michael asking, but being a made basket, couldn't he run the baseline? Well, the question is not the the thrower moving. That was legal. The, the toss to the teammate here, which he thought was, no, you take the throw in instead of me, was actually considered to be a throw-in pass because the throw-in had begun by rule, right? The ball was at the disposal of the player, and the mm -hmm. official had begun their count. So that would be our reasoning. On Let's look at another bonus play. Well, that is not something you see every day. Every day. Uh, we have an end-of-game scenario, four-point lead, clock strikes zero, the official is about to leave the floor, and we have a technical foul. Yeah, I, uh, I had a buddy of mine send this to me. Um, two, two really good Class B, so lowest level uh, basketball teams in our state. And, yeah, I mean, we can look at the initial play, um, I, I'm not really sure if there really is even much at all. Um, I think the guy just ends up tripping as he's shuffling, but w we can, we can argue about that all day. But the following things that happen is, I mean, you don't necessarily want a player to get away with saying something to you, but can we get out of this situation without a technical is the first question because the clock at zero. And then he says something to you. I think we can get out and just take off running. Let's just not even listen to anything they're saying and get out of there. But if we do call this, a technical foul now we got to know was there time on the clock first off if i mean obviously it happens after the clock and the buzzer goes off but is there mm -hmm. any time on the clock secondly we got to look at okay now what's the score because in high school the only way we're shooting free throws on a technical foul when the clock strikes zero is if it can dictate the outcome of the game whether that puts them ahead by one and wins the game or makes both of them and they tie the game so even, let's say, for example, the score's at, you know, he makes a shot, it's at 48, and then the score's at 50. We shoot that first free throw, he misses it, the game's over. We don't need to shoot that second free throw either. Um, so there's a lot of things that come into play there. But in this situation, 
The two free throws. They shoot the two free throws. I think he makes both of them, so they lose by two technically. But that's the high school rule. That's not how that goes. The college rule with betting and gambling, things like that going on, you got to mm-hmm. shoot all the free throws. You got to make sure every point is accounted for. And so um, that, in, in, in as far as I'm aware, that's both college men and women. But yeah, in high school, if we can get out of there, let's just run away, get out of there as quick as we can. Um, not saying the official did something wrong here. I'm just saying, let's just try to get out of there. Clock's at zero. Yeah, I guess the other variable would be, does the does the technical foul rise to the level of flagrant, right? You've been sure. cheating us all sure. night, ref, right? Or yeah. you, you know. Uh, tirade expletives, etc. Maybe, maybe the um, yeah. the guidance at, at this league or level is uh, intolerance for vulgarity or whatever. That's something yeah. we have at the JC level on the women's side here in Northern California, where uh, you know if a player drops a an f bomb or something, that's a flagrant foul. Yeah. Are we? Do we need to report this foul, even if we do have the tactical? <sighs> I don't. E- I don't even know. I don't even know if we need to, just because of what the time is on the clock. It's it's zero, and so I I don't. I don't think we do. But you know, say what what you're talking about. If it's if it rises to an ejection level technical, now we got to report this because now we're ejecting the player, even after the game is over, which is unfortunate. But he, I think in South Dakota they have to sit out a game if you get ejected from a game. Yeah, and so. If, if we're looking at it from that, um, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I guess if you call it, we might need to report it. It's just such a weird situation. It is. And we have to be ready to uh, uh, recognize that this we're opening a box. <laughs> Other yeah. stuff could happen. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, and I mean, th- this is the worst part is you call that technical. Next thing you know, some other kid lips off to you or the coach lips off to you. Now you've got six free throws, and we have to shoot them now because six points could impact the outcome of the game. Right, so who is ahead in this uh, scenario? The team in, the team that gets a technical is ahead. Okay. They're ahead by, they're ahead by four. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. So, so uh, <laughs> we just... Right. You know, in this situation, our training is we're leaving the court. We're going to leave the visual confines. If something yep. occurs that rises to the level, we cannot ignore this. Like, let's yeah. say rather than um, uh, s- saying something to us, it was a taunting action towards another player yep. um, or, uh, again, something that rose to a different level of a racial epithet, uh, homophobic mm-hmm. slur or something like that, you know, something that cannot be ignored and needs to be addressed. If we don't address it, it's going to potentially, you know, so it puts us in a tough spot, but we do, like you say, need to know what is the proper adjudication here. Are we going to shoot free throws at the high school level? In this instance, the answer would be no. So, all right. So, so I got you. So the Warbirds down, they score six, a uh, four point game. Ref, you suck. We're going to assess technical foul. Our crew's like, what you doing, bro? Come on, let's get out of here. (laughs) You go, Andrew. I appreciate you joining today, sharing the clips, uh, analyzing the plays, breaking down game video, helping us get better as basketball officials. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it as well. Um, Yeah, I always like doing that and, and helping people learn. I mean, obviously, I don't know how you, if you like plugs or not, but I like the rules talk for referees on Facebook. That's where I post a lot of plays, give a lot of rulings. Um, a more, majority of the time I'm right, but the last two weeks it felt like I've been more wrong than right on a lot of those plays that we've seen. Um, but, yeah, that's just a, it's a good one that's been started. I know you're like a, a – um, I'm trying to think of the word that they use to describe you. You're not a moderator. You are a rules, a rules expert is what the phrase is. So, yeah, if people want to check that out and get on Facebook and join that group, we'd love to have you in there to give some comments about plays and even post plays so we can all get better. Awesome. Well, I'll put a link to the Facebook group uh, down below. And that's that's really you, you sort of touch on. Um, we post plays. We we think we have a ruling. We think we know all the variables, but then we get some information, right? And it helps us 
you know, counterbalance. Somebody comes in and says, well, what about this? And then we, you know, change our perspective and get a firmer understanding of the rules. You know, we like to describe our, our rules knowledge and awareness about plays as being like a block of cheese, a round of cheese. It's smooth. It's solid. There's, you know, no imperfections, etc. It's really solid. But then we slice that cheese open and there's some little bubbles in there. There's some gaps, some lack of awareness. Um yeah. And things that we can get better as, and that it's the discourse between officials, the communication, the sharing of ideas and perspectives um, that helps us uh, smooth those out and become better as basketball officials. Yep, absolutely. And everybody like this, like this channel, like this page. Uh, that way we can get good content like this from Greg. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to stick around with the, the live stream. Um, I'm going to stick around with the live stream viewers for a little bit. Yeah. You go officiate your game and do me a favor, Andrew. Call it both ways. Come on, I'm ref. <laughs> I'll keep the fouls even. How's that sound? Just kidding. And wear the jacket. Wear the yeah, jacket. Okay. I'll take a picture in the locker room for you all. You can send it out if you want. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right, Andrew. Take care. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining us today for Five Play Friday. If you would do me a favor and do all the things. If you found value, make sure to hit the like button. That really helps us with the YouTube algorithm, helps get the vet, the video in front of more basketball officials so we can all get better together. Awesome. Let me get uh, t thank those who fuel our broadcast. Our tremendous show supporters up on the big board today is James Frazee, Yvette Perry, Aaron Wall, Jacob Krause and Mike Connors. Much appreciated and much love. Yes, there's going to be a link in the show notes below. And yes, of course, I will make sure there is one. Where? <coughs> Up above. Awesome. We have additional video content. It's available for you right here. I have made this choice of a previous Five Play Friday episode. YouTube makes this choice as what would be best for you to watch. Make your choice. Choose wisely. We'll see you in the next one. Take care.